Reflection and Refraction going to be the topics of this lesson in my new General Physics playlist, which when complete will cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now when light is traveling from one medium to the next, a couple different things might happen at that medium, and that's what we're going to concern ourselves with this lesson. Now the first might be reflection, and we'll spend a very little bit of time talking about the law of reflection. But the light that is actually transmitted into the next medium, provided it's transparent, so what happens is it bends a little bit, or at least it changes direction, and we call this refraction. We're going to talk about the index of refraction. We're going to talk about Snell's law of refraction. We'll talk about the special case of total internal reflection and spend just a little bit of time talking about dispersion. My name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. So let's first describe reflection and refraction. And if we take a look at, say, maybe some uh, light rays entering water, and we use these lovely ray diagrams where you use straight line rays to kind of identify light rays, if you will. So, and if we're going from, say, air to water, and this doesn't have to be air and water, but if we're going from one medium to the next, and assuming that they are both transparent mediums, so we got a couple different things of what might happen at this interface. Now, one is you might get some reflection here. So, and it turns out, we draw the normal here, the perpendicular to the surface, and the angle that the light ray makes with respect to that, the one that's entering, we're going to call this theta. So, and it turns out we have one simple law of reflection. The angle of incidence, we call this, is equal to the angle of reflection. And so a couple different ways we might define this. We might call this theta 1, we might call this theta 1 prime. So, and big thing here with Angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. Angle or theta one equals theta one prime. That's the law of reflection. So, and it doesn't matter what this angle is, that angle of incidence will equal the angle of reflection, assuming this is a fairly flat, smooth surface. You know, if it's choppy water and stuff like that, well, you're, you're gonna get a little uh, more complicated effect that's beyond the scope of this course. But for a smooth interface between the two mediums, Angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. And we don't really want to go too much more into it than that. The rest of this lesson is going to be spent talking about refraction. Now, in most cases, not all of that light is going to be reflected. Some portion of it is actually going to get passed along into the next medium, which might be water, as in this case, or something like this. So, and it turns out, though, when you go from one medium to the next, typically the light rays are going to, we say, bend. So it might be better just to say that they change direction. So it's usually fairly slight, but it can be more profound in, in certain cases and stuff like this. So in the case of going from uh, air to, say, water, we might find that they would actually change directions. So towards the normal. And again, this angle right here, we'd now call our angle of refraction. So in this case, we often call it theta 2. And so it turns out that it's typically not the case that your angle of incidence equals your angle of refraction. So the only way that would be true is if the two substances you're dealing with happen to have the exact same index of refraction, which we'll talk about next. So now let's focus just on the refraction. In fact, the rest of this lesson, we will only be focusing on the refraction. So is there a potential for a reflected ray? Yes, and we're just not considering it. We want to focus just on the refraction. Now before we do that, we've got to talk about uh, some properties of the electromagnetic waves as they're being transmitted from one medium to the next. And to do that, we have to identify what we call the index of refraction. So n, which is equal to the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum relative to the speed of light in that medium. And the reason we identify this is because the speed of light in a medium is going to change relative to the speed of light in a vacuum. It turns out no matter what medium you shine light through, it's going to be slower than the speed of light in a vacuum. And so if you look then, if the speed of light in a vacuum relative to the speed of light in that medium, if this is always going to be slower than C, the speed of light in a vacuum, then this ratio is always going to be larger than 1. And the bigger it gets, the slower the light is in that particular medium. Now if you take a look at air, speed of light in air is almost exactly 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Almost. It's like 2.99 and some change. So, and as a result, turns out the index of refraction for air is like 1.0003. Whereas this, you know, index of refraction for a vacuum would be, I guess, 1 by definition. So, but notice that what that means then is that the speed of light in air 
is almost exactly the same as the speed of light in a vacuum. In fact, we treat them as being the same value, 3.0 times 10 to the eighth, because just to like two sig figs, it's exactly true. You've got to carry out much more sig figs to see where they start to differ more appreciably. Now, in the case of, say, water, it turns out the index of refraction for water is actually 1.33. For certain types of glass, it's 1.52. Depending on the substance, it changes. And so the speed of light is changing. Now, you might be asking the question, be like, I thought the speed of light was a constant. Well, the speed of light in a vacuum is a constant. It's a constant 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. But it turns out once you take it out of a vacuum, even going through air, what you're going to find out is that the electric field of the electromagnetic waves is going to start interacting with matter. And while in air, matter is pretty diffuse and spread out, so there's not a lot of matter for it to interact with, and so it doesn't change things appreciably. But once you get into liquids and solids that are transparent, as the light is transmitted into those, uh, you get stronger and stronger interactions between the electric field of the electromagnetic waves and any kind of uh, protons, electrons, dipoles uh, that are present in that matter. And the stronger they are, oftentimes the greater the interaction. And they ultimately tend to decrease the electric field and overall slow down the overall speed of light in that medium. So this index of refraction is kind of our, our big go-to characteristic for defining a medium. And the larger it gets, the slower the speed of, uh, of light in that particular medium. Okay, so if the speed of light is changing, what else is changing? Because if you recall, we said that the frequency times the wavelength was equal to the speed of light. And that is true, but it's true in the medium as well. And so if you're in some other medium, the frequency times the wavelength is going to equal the velocity as well. Now here's the deal. If you're going from one medium to the next, the frequency doesn't change. If the frequency either sped up or slowed down, you would have a problem with what's going on at the interface. If it was slowing down, you get this buildup of wavelengths piling up at the interface, waiting to get transmitted because the frequency was slower in the new medium. So it turns out it's just impossible. The frequency can't speed up or slow down. The frequency from one medium to the next is exactly the same. And so any change in the speed of light is not due to a change in the frequency, it's due to a change in the wavelength. So if the speed of the light in the medium goes down, it's because the wavelength is going down proportionally. Now, one thing to keep in mind, like when I talk about violet light, and I say violet light has a wavelength of right around 400 nanometers. Well, I'm referring to the wavelength of violet light in a vacuum, which is almost exactly the same as the wavelength of violet light in air. So however, if you shine that violet light in, you know, underwater or something like this, the color of that light is not going to change. I want to make that clear. It's still violet light but it will have a different wavelength in that new medium, say water or whatever. So, so keep in mind that color doesn't change, frequency doesn't change, but the wavelength and the speed are what are changing. So just keep that in mind. All right, now the reason we're kind of introducing this index of refraction is that we can predict the angle of refraction using what's called Snell's law of refraction, which is what we're gonna take a look at next. So here we have Snell's law of refraction. N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2, where N1 is the index of refraction of the medium the light is coming from. N2 is the index of refraction of the medium where the light is ending up at, going to, being transmitted into. Theta 1 is the angle of incidence, theta 2 the angle of refraction. So angle of incidence, angle of refraction, N1, N2. So, and if you notice, like if you, you know, you envision this as being air and water, then air would be N1, correspond to N1 anyways, and water would correspond to N2. But nothing says we couldn't shine light from underneath the water out. And in that case, then the water would have been N1 and the air would be N2. Again, wherever the light is beginning, the medium of origin, that's going to correspond to N1. And wherever it is transmitted into the next medium, that's going to correspond to N2. Now, big consequence here, I want you to realize something. So if we Remind yourself what a sine function looks like. So we've got here zero degrees. Sine function looks like this. So all the way to 360 degrees. Well, the big thing I wanna make a cutoff here is at 90 degrees. And so if you look, what is the smallest angle we could possibly have relative to the normal for light being shined from one medium to the next? Well, the smallest it could be is zero if it's going straight in. So, and it turns out in such cases, then it just comes straight out the other side right along the normal as well. It's only when you come off the normal that you're gonna see this bending of the light we call refraction.
And so in this case, it turns out then what's the biggest angle of incidence it could be? Well, to still be being transmitted from this medium, the biggest it's gonna be away from that normal, it's gonna approach 90 degrees, but it's never going to be larger than 90 degrees. So the reason I highlighted 90 here is I wanted you to see what the sine function does just in this little narrow window. The sine function only grows. So it only gets larger as long as we're restricting ourselves to talking only about angles from zero to 90 degrees as we are doing right here. And so when we're talking about reflection, I'm sorry, when we're talking about uh, incident angles and refracted angles, 90 degrees is the maximum you're gonna be away from the normal, no, never anything larger. All right, so if we take a look at Snell's law one more time then, so we can make some conclusions about when N1 is larger or N2 is larger. And so let's just start off talking about when N1 is larger than N2, and then we'll talk about when N2 is larger than N1. Now, if N1 is larger than N2, so what that would mean here is that N1 is larger, N2 is smaller. Well, then to maintain that equality, if N1's larger, then sine theta one's gonna have to be smaller than sine theta two. Now, sines again, if we hadn't kind of made this determination, well, again, as long as we're restricting ourselves to just talking about from zero to 90 degrees, as theta goes up, sine theta goes up. And so instead of saying with N1 being larger, sine theta one has to be smaller, we can actually make it even simpler and just say theta itself is gonna have to be smaller, whereas over here, theta two is gonna have to be larger because theta and sine theta correlate at least from zero to 90. And so whichever side has the larger value of the index refraction is gonna have the smaller angle. So it's always going to work that way with refraction. So whichever side has the smaller index of refraction is gonna have the larger angle. And so going over here, if you look, we can see that our angle of incidence was bigger than our angle of refraction. Well, why would that be? If this has got the bigger angle, so then N1 versus N2 here, if this has got the bigger angle, it must have had the smaller index of refraction. So this would be a case where N1 was less than N2, or if you wanna say N2 is greater than N1, same diff. And so if the refracted ray bends toward the normal, that's indication that you've gone from a lower index of refraction to a higher index of refraction, or another way of phrasing that, would be to say that the speed of light has slowed down from one medium to the next. So let's take a look at the opposite possibility here. We'll draw in the normal. So, but in this case, we're gonna have this bend away from the normal. And so now again, our incident angle, our angle of incidence, theta one, as compared to our angle of refraction, now theta two is bigger. And the reason theta two is bigger must be because instead of the speed of light slowing down, the speed of light must have sped up. So N2 down here versus N1 up here. If I get the bigger angle, it must be because we have the smaller index of refraction. And again, I'm not, I haven't provided any kind of like explanation for why this is or how this works. I'm just interpreting the math here in light of the relationship between theta and sine theta and this equality here we call Snell's law. So, but it's really convenient. You wanna be able to predict whether or not uh, your refracted angle is gonna bend toward the normal or away from the normal. And it's all, did the index refraction you enter, is it higher than the one you started with or lower than the one that you started with? That's kind of the key. So before we move on, we wanna get some practice in. I've got a few sample calculations we wanna work out. And so the first one uh, just says, what is the speed of light in a medium having an index of refraction of 2.0? So here, N is equal to 2.0. Well, again, if you remind yourself what an index of refraction is, it's the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in the medium. And if that ratio is equal to two, that just simply means that the speed of light in the vacuum is twice as big as the speed of light in that medium. Well, we know the speed of light in a vacuum is 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And if that is twice as big as the speed of light in that medium, you can you know, do the math pretty well in your head, which is why I chose a nice round number for that index of refraction here. So but if we take N equals C over V, rearrange it, V is gonna equal C over N, which in our case is 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, all over 2.0. And that velocity is therefore going to come out to 1.5 times 10 to the 8th meters per second.
So ultimately, you can kind of look at it. If your index refraction is two, it's because the speed of light in the medium is half that of what it is in, in a vacuum. If your index refraction was 3.0, it would mean that the speed of light in that medium is one third of what it is in a vacuum, so on and so forth. Now, obviously, if you don't have a nice round number, you can use the equation, but I wanted you to at least in principle kind of see what this index or refraction implies about the speed of light in that medium relative to a vacuum. Now, the next question we're gonna look at, the wavelength and frequency of orange light in a vacuum are 600.0 nanometers and 5.0 times 10 to the 14th hertz respectively. So let's start that off in a vacuum. Okay, so the wavelength is 600.0 nanometers, frequency is 5.0 times 10 to the 14th hertz. And the question is, what are the frequency and wavelength in a medium having an index of refraction of 2.0? So now we've got some new medium with an index of refraction of 2.0, What's the new frequency? What's the new wavelength? And again, the big thing you're supposed to remember is that as light is transmitted from one medium to the next, the frequency remains constant. So that hasn't changed. Frequency is still 5.0 times 10 to the 14th hertz. But the question is, what is the new wavelength? And again, the light is still orange light, but it's no longer gonna have a wavelength of 600.0 nanometers. Now, a couple different ways to look at this. So if you look at the relationship between frequency, wavelength, and the speed of the wave in that medium, the frequency hasn't changed, but the velocity in this case has gone down relative to a vacuum by a factor of two. Well, velocity and wavelength are gonna be proportional if the frequency is remaining constant. So if the velocity has gone down by a factor of two, the wavelength's gone down by a factor of two. And if you know that, you're like, well, going down by a factor of two would mean that our wavelength's gonna drop down to 300.0 nanometers. And that is true. Now there's a couple different ways you could go about figuring this out. So one is you could figure out what that velocity of the wave is based on your index refraction, which we already did. So, and then you could say again that your frequency times your wavelength equals that velocity. And so your wavelength must equal the velocity over the frequency, which in this case would be that 1.5 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, all over 5.0 times 10 to the 14th hertz, which is an inverse second, so these will cancel, and it'll come out in meters, and then you convert it to nanometers and stuff like this. So, but lo and behold, if you did this with 3.0 times 10 to the eighth, all over the frequency, you'd get the 600 nanometers. I mean, you'd, you'd get like 6.0 times 10 to the negative seven meters, something like that, and convert to nanometers. So if we're doing it with half as big a number of the numerator, that's why it's gonna give us half as big a wavelength in this case. But by all means, let your calculator do the heavy lifting for you, but it will indeed be 300.0 nanometers here. Okay, now the other way you could approach this, so keep in mind that the index or refraction is equal to C over V where this is the frequency times the wavelength, and I'll call them F naught and lambda naught for being in a vacuum, all over F in that medium and lambda in that medium. So, but in this case, the frequencies don't change. And so another way to look at this is that the index refraction is not only equal to the speed of light in a vacuum relative to the speed of light in that medium, it's equal to the wavelength of the light in the vacuum relative to the wavelength of light in the medium as well. And we could have just gone about it this way as well and just said, okay, well, the index of refraction was 2.0. That's equal to the wavelength of vacuum of 600.0 nanometers all over the wavelength in that medium. Move this over, divide by two, and you get your 300.0 nanometers that way as well. So the next three questions are gonna involve mostly Snell's law of refraction. And you're gonna do a lot more calculations with Snell's law of refraction then you are with the law of reflection. And it's not really a calculation, right? The angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. But we're so used to getting bombarded with questions regarding refraction that be careful they don't just slip one about reflection in like I'm about to here. The question says, if the angle of incidence of a flashlight's beam into a lake is 30.0 degrees, what is the angle of reflection? And then notice in this question, I'm nice enough to then provide you with indices of refraction. The index of refraction of air is 1.00 and the index of refraction of water is 1.33, but you don't need the indexes of refraction because I'm asking about the angle of reflection. And so in this case, uh, in fact, I'm not even gonna justify this by writing it on the board, but if the angle of incidence is 30 degrees, then the angle of reflection is also 30 degrees. Law of incidence equals law of reflection, done. Or I'm sorry, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, done. That's the law of reflection. 
All right, but the next question might have been the one you thought you were being asked, and it says if the angle of incidence of a flashlight's beam into a lake is 30 degrees, and so we'll shine this in here, angle of 30 degrees, so let's get that normal on there. So in this case, this angle of incidence relative to the normal again is 30 degrees. The question is, what is the angle of refraction? And then the index of refraction of air is given as 1.00 and for water, so N1, N2, 1.33. Now notice I divided, you know, uh, identified them as N1 and N2, but again, wherever the light starts, that's N1 according to Snell's law, wherever the light ends up going to next is N2. All right, so those indices, indices of refraction were provided. And notice if we're going from a smaller index of refraction to a larger index of refraction, well, again, if the index of refraction goes up, then the angle must go down. And so this is gonna to bend towards the normal. That way we get a smaller angle theta two right there. And so we know it's gonna be less than 30 degrees. The question is, well, what is that angle? Well, that's what we're gonna use Snell's law for, and we are definitely going to rely on our calculator to accomplish this. And so we've got N1, sine theta one equals N2 sine theta two, and N1 is just the 1.00. So sine of 30.0 degrees equals N2, 1.33 times the sine of theta two. And so we're gonna divide over here by 1.33 and then take the inverse sine, and we'll definitely let our calculator do the heavy lifting for us here. Uh, obviously anything times one is itself, and sine of 30 is one half. I made the, the math nice here. So we've got one times a half, and then divided by 1.33. So 0. 0.5 divided by 1.33 equals like 0. 0.3759 something something change, and then we'll just take the inverse sine of that answer, and we'll get 22.08, and I'm gonna round it to three sig figs here, so 22.1 degrees. Okay, so there's your first application of Snell's Law. This next question is going to look a little bit familiar. Uh, it says an underwater diver shines a flashlight toward the surface. If the angle of incidence is 22.1 degrees, what is the angle of refraction? So this is kind of the exact reverse of what we just did here. So now instead of the lights originating from the side with the air, so the light is going to originate now from the side of the water, from this underwater diver. We'll get the normal on there, and we're starting with an angle of 22.1 degrees. That should look pretty familiar here. That was this angle right here, the angle of refraction. That's gonna be our angle to start with. And we're starting with N1 being 1.33, and then N2 now being 1.00. And so let's go back and set up Snell's law one more time. So we're gonna have N1 sine theta one equals N2 sine theta two. N1 is now 1.33 times the sine of 22.1 degrees equals N2, which is the 1.00 times sine of theta two. And if you look at the math on this, compare it to this equation right here, you had one times sine 30 one times sine of theta two, but on the other side, notice it's exactly the same here. It's 1.33 times sine of theta two, where that theta two was 22.1 degrees. So the 1.33 was ultimately being multiplied by sine of 22.1. So if this side is the same as this side, well then the other side, which has a 1.0 here, is also gonna have a 30 degree theta two. So, and we'll confirm that with our calculator. So, but Snell's law here is completely reversible if you kind of reverse the, the ray diagram here. And so in this case, we take 1.33 1 times the sine of 22.1 and then divided by one. And then we're gonna take the inverse sine of all of that. And we're gonna get 30.025, which I'm gonna round to 30.0 degrees. At the very least, if we were drawing the ray diagram in, we're going from a larger index of refraction to a smaller. And so if the index of refraction is getting smaller, then the angle must be getting larger, so we're bending away from the normal. And so theta two is gonna be bigger than theta one over here. And in fact, 
we were just doing this exact diagram in reverse. So the next topic involves refraction, or really the absence of refraction, and it's called total internal reflection. Now it turns out when you go from an area where you've got a higher index of refraction to an area of lower index of refraction, we saw that the angle is gonna kind of bend away from the normal. So we got this angle of incidence, and because you're going to a lower index of refraction, you've gotta get a larger angle of refraction. It turns out this idea of total internal reflection is only possible when you get a larger angle of refraction than the angle of incidence, when that uh, transmitted ray bends away from the normal. And if you make this angle of incidence bigger, the angle of refraction will get bigger. And at some point, you've made this angle big enough that the angle of refraction is going to be 90 degrees. And it turns out we refer to this angle right here as the critical angle. And ultimately what's happening here is if, if the angle of refraction is 90 degrees, then the light's being refracted, we'll call it, right along the interface between the two mediums. But none of the light is actually being transmitted into that second medium whatsoever. And so at this point, no refraction into that next medium is ultimately taking place. You're only getting reflection, no refraction, hence the name total internal reflection. Now, if we take a look at what this is, means in terms of Snell's law, So a couple things here. So one, we're gonna input the critical angle here. And when you hit that critical angle, the angle of refraction comes out to 90 degrees. Well, the sine of 90 is one, and anything times one is itself. So that ultimately just kind of falls out of the equation. And so if you go ahead and solve for the sine of that critical angle, you get N2 and we'll divide through by N1. So and if you take the inverse sine, you solve for that critical angle. And ultimately, any light being shined towards the surface at any angle equal to or larger than that angle will lead to no refraction whatsoever and only reflection. So let's give an example of this. So next question says, what is the critical angle for total internal reflection for light traveling from, from glass to air? So, and the index of refraction of air is given as 1.00 and for glass as 1.50. So, and again, you could always, you know, plug and chug this with Snell's law, but typically this is an equation that is presented and definitely kind of uh, already reduced down for us for quick calculation. It's what we'll use. We'll take the inverse sine, N2 over N1, so 1.00 over 1.50. Let our calculator do the heavy lifting for us. So the inverse sine parentheses of one divided by 1.5, close the parentheses. We're gonna get 41.8 degrees with three sig figs. Cool, so we kind of showed why this only works when you're going from medium of higher index refraction to lower index refraction, because we need this uh, refracted rate to bend away from the normal to the point where it no longer actually is being refracted. Now you can look at it mathematically as well. So here we're taking the inverse sine of this ratio. Well, you can only take the inverse sine of things that are actually in the range of what the sine function is. And the sine goes from negative one to a maximum positive one. It can't be larger than positive one uh, if you're gonna take uh, uh, if you're gonna, if it's part of the sine function. So if you're gonna take the inverse sine, you can only take the inverse sine of a number that's between negative one and positive one. And so here N2 has to be smaller than N1. If it was the other way around, you actually mathematically couldn't take an inverse sine. And so whether you wanna look at it conceptually or mathematically, so total internal reflection is only possible when you're going from a region with a higher index of refraction to a region with a lower index of refraction. Now one common example, and really useful use of total internal reflection is fiber optic cables. And so fiber optic cables are either a glass or plastic cable that they coat with a special coating. And this special coating has a much lower index of refraction than the glass or the plastic that the cable is made out of. So in such a way so that we can shine light in one end of this cable and it's going to reflect so, but not refract whatsoever because you're always gonna be greater than that uh, critical angle. And so this is gonna keep reflecting all the way down and get transmitted through this cable. And it's nice and flexible and we have a light signal, if you will. 
Well, these can replace electric signals, which involve copper wires, which are much larger and more expensive to manufacture and things of a sort. Uh, and, and also, these light signals travel faster. They're traveling at the speed of light. Now, they're not going in a straight line or anything like that, but still, if you're traveling at the speed of light, you're gonna trump any kind of electric signal which does not travel at the speed of light, uh, hands down. It's not even close. So, really useful in fiber optic cables, which are commonly used for the internet and, and the phone systems uh, that still have landlines anyways, and things of this sort. Now, one last topic we wanna talk about, it's called dispersion. So, and we're gonna look at it purely conceptually, no math involved in this part whatsoever, but dispersion results from the fact that uh, it turns out the index of refraction is wavelength dependent. Now it turns out it also has a temperature dependence that we're totally not gonna look at, but it is wavelength dependent. The different wavelengths of light actually have slightly different indices of refraction in a particular medium. So like when we gave you an index of refraction all throughout this lesson, what we're usually giving you is some sort of average across all the wavelengths. So, and that average is pretty effective. Like let's say you're using like white light, which is really kind of all the wavelengths and stuff like that, life is good. So, but when you start doing refraction with white light, so the longer that light travels, it might actually separate into colors because of these slightly different indices of refraction. So one thing you should know is that for most mediums, there's an inverse relationship. The index refraction is gonna be higher for the shorter wavelengths. So for example, like we gave you the index of refraction of water is 1.33. Well, it turns out it's not quite so easy. So we can talk about the index of refraction for red light in water. So versus blue light in water. And so if you look, blue's definitely got the shorter wavelength, uh, around 400 nanometers, red's closer to 700 nanometers. So for the shorter wavelength, we should expect a higher index of refraction. So, and that's what we see. If I wanted to actually give it an extra decimal place here, it's 1.343. And for red light at the same temperature, it's like 1.330. And so very subtle difference in the index of refraction. Well, what would this do? Let's take a look here. So let's get a interface between air and water. Now let's shine some light through. So let's start with the red light. Let's get our normal on the diagram. And as we're going from a lower index of refraction to a higher index of refraction, therefore, if you're going from lower to higher, then your angle has to get smaller, so it's gonna to bend towards the normal. So here, theta one versus here, theta two, it got smaller, okay. So, but instead of white light, let's say this really was red, y, uh, red, red wavelengths of, you know, right around 700 nanometers or so, where the index of refraction was 1.33. But let's say we also shine blue light right along that same path. So, and now it's got the same incident angle, but with an, a little bit larger index of refraction, it's gonna wanna get the angle smaller, that angle of refraction even smaller. It's gonna wanna bend towards the normal even more, if you will, and follow a slightly different path here for a smaller theta two, if you will. Cool, and I, I kind of took the edges of the visible spectrum with red light on the longer end uh, for wavelength and red light, uh, I'm sorry, and blue light on the shorter end for wavelength. So, but you'd have all the different colors in between if it was actually white light being shined through. And so this is what happens when you shine white light through a prism. It's because of those different, uh, slightly different uh, uh, values for the index of refraction for the different colors, they get split on a slightly different path. And if you shine them on a screen, you can see the entire spectrum. That white light gets broken up into its colors. So it is also a consequence of this that we can see rainbows and things of this sort. You're getting dispersion in raindrops as well. Now, it's a little bit more of a complex phenomenon, but it's still a result of dispersion. If you found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.